Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. It's so great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on today. Thank you. We've got a great lineup for you. I'm Dr. Pat. I'm the host of the Dr. Pat Show. And I am here with a few of my sidekicks, Benny and Zach. Hi, Benny. Hey, what's up, Dr. P? Yeah. Um, So... You know, recently I've been talking about my mom, right? Mm-hmm. And talking about how she raised us girls. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm I'm not so sure it was the same for my brother. My brother was 10 years younger. But for us girls, it was really clear to us what we believed in and what she believed in and what she taught us about all people. And so, you know, when we're thinking about today and we're thinking about the, the people that uh, have been influential both in our lives, my lives, but clearly in my mom's life, coming from the deep south, right? I mean, I shared a little bit about this story about my mom and my grandparents, n- no real kitchen, potbelly stove, outhouse, like seriously, right? Mm -hmm. And you would think to yourself, well, wait a minute, you know, what year are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about like, uh, you know, I'm talking about like 1965, you know, Mm -hmm. like by then you think everybody, no. Um, And so today I just am really struck by uh, the passing of John Miles Lewis. And for those of you, you know, you might be thinking, well, you know, this is, it's a tragedy to see him pass. And it is, but it's a tragedy to see what he stood for. And, you know, when I think about my stepmom and I think about some of the things she did that we didn't know about till later, but some of the things she did how she was out in the world, what she stood for, what she marched for. It's not a wonder that those values have been instilled on me. And so today it is a moment that we take for this man who knows what it's like to stand for what he believed in, to get beaten within an inch of his life, as she would say. And to understand, you know, what is it that's important to us? And I remember my mom saying to me for one of the first times she she talked to us girls, you know, and I overheard we overheard her arguing with my dad. So I come from a family where I have my stepmom like this. And then we have the other side of the family, my dad. And they were very different on political issues. They were not of the same party. And so I will tell you, most of the conversations at the table were really interesting. (laughs) Um, But one of the things I heard her ask my dad, which I never forgot, and by the way, he never answered. And I couldn't remember if it was when John Kennedy died, but it was one of them. I know there was a period, there was a year in my mom's life where she cried a lot, starting with Marilyn Monroe. But I remember her asking him, Tony, and and not like that, because she was a fired up Southerner. And you could just, I mean, when she got cracking with that Southern jaw, you were like, what is she even saying? But I remember this, and we would always listen from the other room, right? Because we didn't like to get in the middle of their business. And she, I remember her saying this, and I never forgot it, and it has been, it has been a question I asked myself in my life. And she looked at him and said, is there anything that you care about so much? You know, John, and she would say, Tony, what would you die for? What would you die for? And that stayed with me because there's so many people today that are taking that stand. They are finding things in their lives and what they believe in 
that they would stand up for. And I never thought in my lifetime that we would come around to this point in time where when a man like John Miles Lewis, you know, takes that last journey, crosses that bridge one more time, that we would be so acutely reminded of what's important to us. One of the things today that I want to speak with my guest about, it's something that I hope we share with all of you. And you've heard me talk about it many times. You've heard me do shows about it. You've heard me talk about my own research and what I studied about the consequences of broken promises in the workplace and beyond. You've heard me discuss parts of that, but I've never really talked about now what? Now what? And so as we look at the landscape in the outside, the outer world, we also have to look at the landscape of our everyday lives. Because I do believe we are different. I do believe we have changed. And out of that, the question that I would ask you and the question that Anne, Anne is going to be joining us, Anne Jersey is going to be joining us to address is, are you willing to be bold, bold to have a future vision for your working life. And what that means is in the context of people passing this weekend, Regis Philbin, I mean, in the context of these things that are going on in the outside world, we're also struck by how we will move forward. But do we have a vision for how we will spend our days, for how we will earn that money? Do we have a vision for that? Do we know what that line is that's in the sand for us. But also the skills that I learned popping myself up from the mailroom to a corporate executive, those skills don't apply in today's world. And there's a very, very good reason. That's what Anne's gonna talk about. That's what she talks about in her fantastic book. And when you think about this, you know, as a trainer, as a speaker, but also, and I will say this because she and I have this in common, as an intuitive, you can only imagine how many feedback, uh, feedback items or surveys she has received. Maybe people saying, like, Anne, you live on another planet. Maybe, yeah. right? That's, mm -hmm. what the, that's it. That's what you, that's it. So right now, we have to be able to bring a different message. Anne has been on radio, television, everywhere. But the question really is for all of us, Benny, as we look at today, what worked for people in the workplace 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago, or three months ago, that is a whole nother way of the way that we are going to talk with Anne about the future. And it's great to have you here today. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. How interesting are you? I love this. <laughs> you are not a fluffy lady. I like this. <laughs> fluffy, I got to tell you, right, Benny? Uh, Benny has a bunch of nicknames for me, but I don't think Benny ever called me fluffy, did you? No, I'd never even go there. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I say no to that one. <laughs> oh, Although I'm going to put it, I'm going to put it in the bank, though, for later. Yeah. <laughs> So, like, Anne, if I could have, like, a poster for every chapter of your book that we could start to circulate, mm. right, into the world, um, it would be such a seriously important message. You know, there's a study that nobody really wants to talk about. This is what I love about corporate work, right? I've done corporate mm. work, right? This is what I love about corporate work. Those of us that have trainers, organizational development people, here's what I love about us. We always know when there's something that an organization or leadership team does not want to face or talk about. We always know mm. it, right? You know it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they'll say, Anne, great. We'd love to hire you, but can you not talk about that thing, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> sometimes we'll take the job or sometimes we won't. Mm. But the thing we have got to talk about today is your book. And the reason I was so beautifully shocked when I 
copy of your book. I mean, beautifully shocked that your number one strategy has to be, has to be, number one and number two, has to be the most important message of navigating through the realms of any organizational work effort. Let's talk about this. I got to ask you, you are bold to write a book and have strategy number B, one be what it is. I know you're bold. I want to ask you this to get us crank, you know, cranking here. I want to know what challenges and what obstacles and you had to personally overcome to get to this very moment, to be talking about this book and strategy number one. <laughs> Whoa, well, um, where do you even start? I didn't, I didn't have a very Take your education. time. Take okay. your time. I didn't have much of an education. So when I left school, I couldn't read and write properly. Uh, what, what they taught me, and you had the same, didn't a very poor background with parents with very, very negative views on money. So my mother loved to buy loads of pretty things and dresses and fur coats and all the things women liked back then. And my dad was terrified of money, rightly so, because his, his family... His mother had to put the children in a workhouse because she couldn't feed them. So he come from extreme poverty. So on one hand, I've got the glamorous mother who spends loads of money and the father going, you've run up another day. I can never. So very mixed messages. Um, and I, I was troublesome at school. That's true. And I find in, in the corporate world, I find it difficult. I do find it difficult on lots of levels. But that's, I think that's why I'm good to go into companies because I'm not a company girl. And I think sometimes you need somebody who's a bit different to come in and say, let's do it a bit different. Come on. Yeah. You know, uh, give you an example. I went into one company and I, I asked them to just write down the six people they make work with the most. And everybody sat there. And if I did that with self-employed people or the oh. average person, they'd just write the six things. Everyone sat there and I said, why aren't you writing anything? They said, we're waiting for the form with the question on one to six. I went, oh, for God's sake, just write it down. You know, so I find it difficult where everything takes so long in the corporate world. And yeah, I've learned to be bold. I've, I had to be bold because I had kids and I had no money. I literally had to be bold. Um, I had to learn to be bold. And I grew up in an area where the women are pretty bold. They're, they're, they're really bold strong I mean, again they've had to be to survive and so yeah the world is changing and we've got to face that change or we are going to have to be in trouble personally as individuals so I was compelled to write that book I was really compelled and it was a risk you think publishers they like you in the spiritual box or the or the business box you don't merge the two because where do we put you people like their their categories, Watkins, amazing publishers, they are, they are wonderful. Yeah. And they come back when we want you. And I thought, wow, that's brave of them. But I could see people really struggling how what's always worked no longer does. And they were burning out and nothing was working for them. And they didn't have a hook on which way to go. And I thought, I've got to go and find out what the strategies we need for the future. I've got to go and find this. I spent five years on this. I normally yeah. spend six months on a book, five yeah. years. I really got into it, really, really got into it. Well, I love that you got into it. And we're going to talk about the 10, 10 strategies, because I want to talk about at number one at the gate. Now I want to talk about the reference to that study I mentioned that nobody's talking about, except I'm talking about it. Um, you and I spent time researching something uh, on a level that most people would like to just blow by, right? Mm -hmm. But the first acknowledgement has got to be that the way that we're approaching the workplace and work, the old ways, the mm -hmm. old guard, you know, I studied with Peter Drucker and I loved studying with Peter, but I got to tell you to, in today's world, you know, we need a new paradigm. If you could take his principles and then tack on your strategies, we might, we might be able to get there. But out of the gate, you talk about something that's so important and you talk about being guided by your intuition. Mm. Now, yeah. and I don't even want to talk about number two. 
uh, understand how you process intuition. Uh, let's talk about them together because right out of the gate, those two things in a book like yours that has work in the title, most people would think we're not going to publish this book. Yeah. But this is the key. Tell me why these two became, you know, how should I say it? Became your platinum platform of understanding. Oh, well, the first thing is there was a major study some years ago where they asked a huge amount of questions to people who were at the absolute top, some that were middle and some were struggling at the lower levels. And they asked them a whole bunch of questions and hidden amongst it was the questions of how much you use your intuition. It would divulge if they use their intuition. And people at the top scored very, very highly on using their intuition. Um, the, the reason, one of the reasons is, and this is more relevant now than 10 years ago when they did the study, um, we are now overwhelmed with data information. We, and if you sit there trying to work your way through it and come to a logical answer, you're going to drown. So it's a, what they found is the combination between scanning, getting an idea of the subject, having a scan of the information, and then seeing what jumps out at you. What is, the, what is it you need to know? But the people at the top use their intuition more. Successful entrepreneurs use their intuition. So I started to go and track them down and hassle people and go, can I buy you a cup of tea? Because we're yeah. in England, so we drink tea. Yeah. Can I buy you a cup of tea? Let's have a chat. It, what, and I started to ask them what their intuition was. And it was interesting because we get that feeling or that thought, but we don't really examine it. So I thought, I'm going to break this down. I want to know what intuition is. I want to know what it is. And it's different for different people. So using NLP techniques, yeah. I studied the submodalities of intuition. So what is it? So for some people that go, oh, I suddenly had this big bright image and it wouldn't go away. And I knew that was the way to go. Somebody else would go, my stomach clenched and everything felt dark. So you, when you actually analyze how intuition works for you personally, you've got something to work with because you've only got to get a slither of it and you go, ah. Oh, uh, I'm being told that. So you and you can actually draw it in. You can go, okay, I'm looking at this new business. Um, what's going on? Oh, I've got the funny feeling. Oh, oh I've got the yeah. big bright feeling. So you can actually um preset it. You can actually say, I'm gonna use my intuition and you know what good and bad or or whatever is. And so I I I, re I had to study it because I wasn't naturally intuitive. Um, I don't have a, an amazing story like when I was a kid, I knew all this stuff. I didn't. I was absolutely yeah. rubbish at intuition. I used to try and be intuitive because <laughs> my grandmother was. I was rubbish. I didn't get anything right, which is good because if you do it naturally, you don't know how you do it. I had to go and I went in search. In my teens, I went in search of the spiritual. And I did what everybody did back then. I went to India. I thought well, it must be the right place because the Beatles went there. You just presume right. if the Beatles went there, it must be right. This is me being naive. And I went off to India and I went to ashrams, nothing. You know, I'm sitting, I'm, I'm not very good at meditation. So I fidget and I keep peeping and not picking up. And um, I started to open up in India. I started to open up and I started to know things. And I've been, since then, I've been studying intuition all those years. I've been studying intuition. Well, and you know, you said something I want to go back to it. For those of you that are just tuning in, I want to make sure you know that, you know, we're talking about future vision, your future vision, you're working like 10 strategies to help you get ahead. But these are strategies and um, and, you know, I want to talk about this. First of all, how do people find out about you and how did they, they get a copy of the book? Let's make sure folks know how to do that. Thank you. Yeah, it's on Amazon. So wherever you are in the world, you can, you can get my book on Amazon you, and you tap in Anjersh or Future Vision, your work in life, it will come up. But yes, yeah, it's, it's on Amazon. It's I'm getting great reviews. So I'm very happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, and let me spell Anne's last name, J-I-R-S-C-H, just so you get there. And if you're following us on Facebook, Zach is putting it up. Um, look, this is a book that for me, when I think about it, I can think about the time in my corporate life. I could think about the t many, many times. Mm. I come from a kind of family that you describe for yourself. 
Mm. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money. I grew up in the projects. Uh, my dad lost everything that he ever had, owed the IRS money for a gazillion years. Instead of paying it off, he just, I don't know what he was thinking with that. <laughs> Um, but we come from that family, you know, on my 11th birthday, my mom got my stepmom and myself and my sisters got hauled off to a precinct in the Bronx because my mom and her best friend got caught shoplifting my gift. Oh. And so, you know, we come from that place mm. where you have to be able to scan your environment and mm. Mm. what you describe that tool that tool, that scanning tool is got me through a lot of my education because I didn't have the reading, the writing coming out of high school. I didn't have the basics. But mm. in today's world, we really have to find a way to honor somebody's process in that realm. You know, I was on a call this morning. I think it was this morning or the other day I, with my team. And I was telling them about a direction I would like to go or how I would like to get there or why I would like to do something like the thing I wanted to do. And what I realized is that there are people that will ask you really detailed questions. Mm. Like, why do you want to do it that way, Pat? You know, what what is the game plan? What is the end? And what I realize is half the time, I cannot explain why. Mm. Half the time, I just know that this is the thing to do, right? Yeah. But let's talk about the second strategy, because mm. you talk about a process. And that, to me, people need a handbook, so to speak. If they are going to operate from that level, what have you learned in your research and writing the book? What have you learned about people like me that step out and use it in the workplace? Clearly, my performance reviews really did say Pat's doing an outstanding job, but we, re we really think she's from another planet. I mean, they <laughs> formal corporate executive performance reviews said that. Wow. What do we say to folks that are out there? Because we have to learn something here. Mm. Well, I suppose if you don't trust your own intuition, what can you trust? Oh, you can't. You know, you, you know I, a friend of mine has just been made redundant, and it was made redundant from the company because they asked each of these employees, two people have got to go out of 10, and they asked each of them, what do you think of your colleagues? So they would stitch each other up, and he just said, I'm not going to badmouth my colleagues. I'm not going to do that. And so the others did. And so he ended up losing his job. You know, you've got to rely on your own intuition if you don't rely on this. I, I like using left and right brain. I, I'm not yeah, just I like that. I'm, I'm not woo woo floating about going, oh, I've got a funny feeling. But to me, it's scientific. And our, if you go back to our ancient ancestors, they were intuitive. They, they would listen to what they called the old man in their head, their dreams. They, their, the hair on the back of their neck would stand up if there was a wild animal nearby. They would get this home, homing device if there was some water or whatever they needed. So they were intuitive. They, they used that. Then we came into time with logic. And, the, and the, they've needed logic up to this time. They've needed it. They needed to put things in place. They needed the practicalities we're just entering the time where we need both. We need some logic, some intuition. Now, if you use both, you are formidable. You, yeah. you will do. You've got to Absolutely. have the common sense. We've all met spiritual people and they never do anything. They just float around in some castle up in the sky. They don't actually do anything. And they talk about their intuition a lot. You've got to, have, you've got to be practical as well. It's like you wouldn't have this successful show if you just sat there using your intuition. You, you, you know, you've taken practical business-like steps in order to put this together to see it straight away how well it's structured it is. So we need, we need both. We need left and yeah. right brain. When you start using both, you will be amazing because most people are floundering right now. With, with the time we're in, this huge worldwide lockdown, people are floundering. Wow, you, you, can, you can absolutely nail it if you use both. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I remember that that comment because uh, I remember doing a talk about this and I said almost exactly what you said, except uh, when I was talking about our ancestors, I made a mm. statement. I said something like, had it not been for uh, practical intuition, I called it, mm. which doesn't make sense. That's like an oxymoron right? To a lot of people. I said, I don't think as a species we'd be here. I said, first, let's talk about intuition because you nailed it. You know, if I am out there and I, 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 I'm way, way, way like thousands of years ago and I am out there and I get a sense that there is a very big animal. Mm. Now, do you think I'm going to leave my cave without my very, very big, big stick? (laughs) <laughs> no, you're not. No. And, you know, if we could think about it the way you write about it, we tap into something I want to talk with you about when we come back. Mm. But this is this is a journey for the bold, I think, mm. because you have to be able to explain to people why you want to do something, why you're taking yeah. this approach. Pat. Why are you taking this approach and training yeah. these, these people, the two new people? What is it about that approach? You know, what is it that you're trying to do by having them learn in this way? The 36,000 foot level, what is your thinking? You know, that. And I'm not a master at it because I have a hard time taking that thing that's on the inside. Mm. And being able to explain to people, this is my rationale for doing that. But that is the key. And that's what I want to talk to you about when we come back. Because I want to talk about what you call ICG, inner creative genius. Ah. When we come back. Uh, For those of you out there, if you're sitting and you're thinking about your day and you're trying to process and you're thinking about, wow, my kids are not going to go back to school. What am I going to do? How am I going to do it? When we come back, Anne is going to walk us through a way for us to, one, avoid burnout, two, to understand and trust ourselves, three, to handle a new creative genius pace that we create, that we create. And the last thing I want to say about this is let's not forget how our ancestors and our parents and generations of people did things that didn't make sense. Stay tuned. Anne's going to take all that on. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Um, You know, today's show for me is highly, highly important. Um, we, We don't. I never think about how Linda does this, but I will say Linda is highly intuitive. Even if Linda will say, I'm not, I'm really logical and practical. Uh, Linda is a triple Virgo and yet she is intuitive. And so how she schedules things is just brilliant. Today, Anne, in talking with you, and I want to honor what you've done in this book. Uh, I hope organizations hire you a lot to come in and help people because You know, like in film, Mm. when they have a film and they go through and they've got days, if not weeks of filming, and then somebody sits down and edits the film. Yeah. We see what that is, Mm. but we don't see what's left on the editing floor. Mm. And the work that you're doing is to help people in in everyday jobs, like I know what an everyday job is. I was homeless at 17. I know what it's like to be digging for garbage. I know like that. Now talk about intuition. We could do a whole show on that. Mm -hmm. But I also know what it's like to enter a workforce at the very bottom level. Mm -hmm. So what you're sharing here today is a blueprint that not only is applicable to work, but is applicable to life. One thing that people are so afraid to talk about, but you're not, and I would love to hear your thoughts on it, 
you could have left the part of in your inner genius out of your book. Yeah. You could have said, this is my book. This is edited. This is on the floor. I'm mm. going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. But you didn't. That to me is, is one of the greatest takeaways. And I hope you can break through corporations and help them with that. I, I'm so glad you said that because I come across so many people and they say, don't die with your music inside you. And most people are going to. Most people are not going to tap into that genius. It's been squashed down. And that, that, when I started reading the research, it was phenomenal. I mean, a lot was triggered from NASA. They, they brought in some scientists um, to highlight who amongst their rocket scientists and engineers, who are the creative geniuses. And the scientists found, uh, found it quite easy to identify. So NASA was very, very happy. But because the test was so simple, they rolled it out and they rolled it out to small children. Wow, they found 98% of very small children are creative geniuses. They play, they let their mind flow. By the time they're 10 and 11, it's dramatically dropped. In their teens, it's dropped. By the time you're an adult, it's about 3%. So and it, what they found was a lot of it is, it's, it kind of gets pushed out of you. And a lot of it is, you, you say something and everyone goes, oh, that's ridiculous. And that's when you start to squash it down. So some organizations are starting to realize this and they're giving their companies, you just say whatever. When you're in a safe space, and you throw in ideas out there and say, well, this might be ridiculous, but let's go with it. Then you start to allow more to come. And the good news is you can get your creative genius back. Now, imagine if everybody has got, they say everyone's got a book inside them. They might or they might not. It might be an invention to help elderly people put on their socks, whatever. You it might be making people laugh, making a great TV show that lifts people's spirits. Whatever it is, whatever your genius is, wouldn't it be amazing to find it and be brave? And it is about being brave to go out there and go, this is my idea. I think it's wonderful. Even if the whole world laughs, because how many people have been laughed at? And then a oh. few years later, they're a huge success. You know, that, that happens so, so often. So I put in a number of um, techniques. The, the book's full of sort of exercises where I help you bring that up. And I love, I love working with that. I've really had such a good time working with groups of people, let's find your essence, let's find your brilliance, let's, let's do something wonderful with it. And then let's find the steps of how you get it out there in the world. Yeah, and I love that in the book, you know, you use a number of examples, but you also talk about the science of intuition too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I think that if you ask, um, if you ask people, right, leaders or not leaders, if you ask people that are out there and mm. have a conversation with them about how they knew to go from here to there, whether that is, how did you go from here to this school? Mm. How did you go from here or, or drive to work? How did you get from here to here, right? Mm. Um, there's something in the nugget that is such, as you say, the secret superpower. Mm. Um, but there is something that I think really holds us back. And we need this now. Yeah, we yeah, need yeah. this. What I'm seeing with people on the ground taking a position for what they believe in, mm. I never really thought that I would see this level of people being so articulate and so passionate. Mm and so future forward about mm. what they believe. Now, yeah. I'm not talking about which side or the other is saying it. That's yeah. not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, when I hear people talking about what's going on with them, you hear them, mm. you hear them. How can you in your, this book, and I love, by the way, I love the exercises. I love the exercises. I'll Thank tell you, you, I got stuck on one of your exercises. Do I dare tell you what it is? Oh, please. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. But I know why I got stuck, stuck on mm -hmm. it. It's the one where you're like, follow situations, right? And you say, relating to images, sounds, and feelings that arise in your mind, focus on the situation. And then you say, you know, create a page for each subject, write the subject at the heading, and then yeah. you go on to say, there's a, here's a list of submodalities, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And a 
time of great success, a time you failed, a time where you yeah. were in the right place, a time where you were in the wrong place, mm. uh, a time. I think you should take that exercise and make that a video. People do a video on that thing. Um, mm -hmm. Because what I loved about it as I went through it, I thought, Anne, I would be hit up with what was most in front of me. You know what I mean? Mm. Like people say, man, how did you create this network, Pat? And how 16 years ago, who told you to do all positive talk? Nobody was doing it. So I thought yeah. it would be like something like that, mm. right? Yeah. And then I did what you said, and I wanted to erase some of my answers. So mm. here's my question. How do we help people that have this inner genius inside of them mm. allow their true nature to show up without the judgment, perhaps, of yeah. our past, but keeping an eye on mm. the future? Well, you summed it up right at the beginning. It's about being brave. Uh, something that really, you know, sometimes you just open a book at random. I was at a friend's house, opened a book at random, and it was a quote in there, and it said, most people are not going to be successful because they're scared of making a fool of themselves. If you want to be successful, you've got to be prepared to make a fool of yourself publicly. Oh, yeah. And we all have a sister or a brother-in-law or a parent that's going, oh, what's she doing now? Oh, that's rubbish. And we have to, what they've noticed about people at the top, they don't care. They do not, they just go and get on with it. If it fails, they go, okay, and they carry on. They don't worry about, they don't care what other people think. They just steam on out there. And so many, how many times have you seen somebody really famous, maybe from the world of movies, and you see an early role and you go, oh, it's so cringy. Oh, I, they don't care. They don't care. They just kept going. And we got to get to that point where we don't, tell, we don't worry what other people think. We just go for it. And, what I did, and it was quite a few years ago, I stopped telling my family anything about my work. I just didn't discuss it ever right. again. I just stopped discussing it. They'd say, oh, you know, oh, does anybody come to you? Or what's the point? And I just didn't discuss it. I would go, oh, did you see that program the other night? I would blatantly change the subject because I thought I don't need their validation. I, I don't need their opinion. And once I stopped that, something shifted. Once I stopped wanting to explain what I do to people and I just went and did it things started to really open up so I think your word brave we need to just be brave and go and that, when they've interviewed people in their 90s the only regrets is the things they didn't do oh, it's yeah. not to do with what didn't happen things they got wrong they messed up none of them regretted the things yeah. they messed up yeah. they regretted and I've, I often say to people, imagine you're very, very old, looking back on your life, would you regret not doing that? And they go, oh, yeah, I wish I'd have gone and followed through that invention or written that book. Yeah, there's your message. Go and do it. Be brave. Go and be really brave. And, and one of the things I want to talk with you about, too, in the book, and for those of you just tuning in and Josh is joining me here today the book is fabulous but for a lot of reasons but you know I always get these books in front of me when I need to be reminded and I want to go through a couple things in here that are so important today and many people that I'm talking with they're like oh I can't do what I am so it, you go through and you give us these strategies that I didn't expect in this book I didn't expect them but when you walk us through and you tell us not only about our creative genius, use our brain. You also say, find your tribe, find your team, yeah, yeah, look for yeah. your mentors, yeah. you know, uh, and I want to talk to you about the stretch time one, but encourage mm. flexibility and understand your purpose. Now, mm. having said those strategies, these are the things that, that I'm finding and you can help people. Mm. COVID-19. Yeah. And I was talking to a woman really early this morning and I was listening to her and I could feel her hopelessness in a lot of levels. Yeah. But she said something to me. And again, I had prepared to talk with you. So I had just read your book last night um, and she talked about not being able to network. Mm. Mm. And when I take all of your strategies together, 
what it's really calling for is for us not to be in search of the normal we think we had, because I don't think most of us were running a quote normal life, mm. but to look at a new paradigm. Mm. And I ask her, what stops you from finding people you really are interested in, picking up the phone and calling them? Yes. What about this CEO you just saw the headlines in the news? Why don't you mm. call him? Yeah. Help us understand how to put these all together and oh, I, the mm. mega effort and the mega result people will get. It, it's such an important subject because where, especially younger people, we grew up in a time where we socialized and people are not, they're in their bedroom, they're on machines, they've got an avatar, you don't even see what they look like. So we're losing that ability to connect more people working from home. Some people work was their lifeline, the only way they ever meet anyone. So imagine during COVID, people in central London, they're living in a small apartment right. across the fortune, and they, they, they're on their own, uh, they're lonely, and they're not even seeing their workmates. People start to go a bit crazy. COVID's actually brought up what we need to look at. It, it's 2020 means clear vision. We've been forced to collectively sit down, shut up, focus, <laughs> and see, see where we're heading. So the tribe, I think, is really, really, really important because we all know thousands of people these days. We know thousands, thousands of friends on Facebook and Twitter and blah, blah, blah. But we don't know them. But they, they won't recognize us in the street. We won't recognize them. We're missing at our tribe. Now, our tribe before was where we grew up. Sometimes where you grew up, you've got a kinship. You know, you know the people, you've got similar values. Now we're mixing with people from everywhere. But we're not finding our tribe. I think... The next step is to find our tribe. Now, the more you're true to yourself and follow your path and do what you love, the easier it is for your tribe to find you. And once you've got your tribe, they get you, you get them. It's a safe place to come up with your genius idea because you're all into the same thing. It doesn't matter if you build skyscrapers out of Lego or you're a Trekkie or whatever it is you're into. I think after Facebook, there'll be something new which is more tribal. It will help you find your tribe based on you, the real you, what you're into, the essence of you. And I think we need- Funny you we, say that. Hmm. Funny you say that. What, with Facebook? You know, this is interesting. Hmm. I love to talk to you about this. Jessica and I went down to LA to do a video shoot. I mean, that's another story, but it literally was a music video with John Legend, right? The singer uh, guy? Yeah. Uh, surreal. You got to be kidding me. Why does anybody want me in any video, let alone singing a song, which, oh my God, Benny, I did sing it off key. So I'm just going to put that out there right there. <laughs> but when we came back on the plane, we're on the plane, Jessica and I are on the plane. We're down there with people. We couldn't believe we were down there with the people we were down there, but we were joined around a purpose to end mm. violence. And we were down there and we're on the way back and it was a late night. And I looked at her and I said, Jessica, I, I feel different. I'm different. And in, uh, no, and I said, how do you feel? And I asked her and she says, I feel different. I said, well, how do you feel? I mean, what is that feeling? And she said, inspired. And I looked at her and I said, you know, we've got to do more. We've got to find a way for people to connect. Yes. That's not like the way. And I yeah. said, it's going to be called AI for the soul. That's mm -hmm. our new project. We're going Ooh. to crowdfund fund for it. Ooh. But it's not based on what's your age, Ann? What do you yeah. like? What's your age? Like, uh, let me let me track you. Like, let me stalk you. Yeah. It's going to yeah. be different. Mm. But do you know how many people discouraged us from the idea? Right? So here's my question to you to help people. Mm. There are so many people out there that have great ideas in the workplace. Yeah. I hope they call you to mm. learn how to talk about their ideas, how to yeah. bring it to the surface. Because I'll tell you, if you don't like feedback or you don't like to be challenged, mm. then this is really going to be bold because people with ideas, I don't care who they are. 
Einstein, yeah. Edison, uh, 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 it, 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 Greta, Greta. Uh, these are people you know of, but every day in every household, there's a man or a woman that gets a genius idea just yeah. to live. How do we help people bring yeah. their idea to bear, Anne? I, I think one of the things we do, I, I put together a, a meditation where people can go within, but they often already know, they've often already thought it. And it's kind of, and they'll say, I'm too busy, or oh, nobody's going to want it. You've got to get rid of all the stuff you put in the way. So I take people through a process. I actually uh, take them into a meditation and we do the process together to get to the future when they've already done it, when it's out there. See, once you go jump into the future to the end result and it's out there, look at the difference it's made. That's when, you one, you start to feel it. It starts to become more real. But then we learn the steps, what you need to do right now. We actually talk to the future you and say, OK, what do I need to know? What's my first step? And so we, we actually, and once you feel what it feels like to have that out there making a difference, once you can feel it, you integrate with it more. You won't put so many barriers in the way. You go, oh, this feels good. Yeah. That's, that's really feels good. Then you, then you, your vibration kind of changes and you allow it to happen and you get involved with the process. So, so yeah, I love working with people and, and companies are starting to wake up. Um, one, of, one of the things I mentioned in the book was 20, about 20 years ago, uh, a CEO of a major car company would come to me every Friday. He was having a really tough time. And he would tell his secretary he was seeing his shrink because he'd rather his, his colleagues thought he was seeing a psychiatrist than seeing a psychic. It was about 17 years ago, I got invited to an event and people openly said, Anne's my business psychic. And it, suddenly wow. there was this shift where people, now people are very open. I mean, just the people that have written uh, on the book, you know, that, that, that offered to, to write on the book, on the back cover and on the inside, it's two Hollywood directors, the head of a network, you know, some very top Norwegian uh, businessmen, some really cool people endorsed my book. And they're open. They're, they're open now. They go, oh, yeah, big meetings in L.A. And they'll go, oh, yeah, I see. And, you know, 20 <laughs> years ago, that would not have happened. That would not. So, so we're actually people in the business world are being more open. I find America more open, to be honest, than anywhere else in the world. They're, they're much more open uh, to admitting and to looking into these things. And, you know, England's still a bit stuck, but people are starting to open up worldwide. And I, and I love that. It's very interesting. I love it too. And I'll tell you the thing I love and we're finding, we have a number of people that host shows on our network from Australia. Mm. And uh, I find, and, and by the way, thank you, Sean. I got to give a shout out to Sean um, over in Australia. We've been sending shows to Australia for, oh my gosh, it's got to be a good 13 years. Mm. And this show and some of our hosts are heard on a massive distribution in Australia. And mm. I never understood it, except I had a psychic come on the show, John mm. Holland one day. And he said, hey, Dr. Pat, can I give you like a little reading? Australia is going to be big in your life. And, you know, when he said it to me, I think I side looked Benny because at that time going in the studio, I think I looked at Benny like, right. And I told John two weeks later, I get this call from Sean in Australia. Wow. But this has got to be the time amongst the chaos mm. that we hone that intuition. Yeah. My intuition not only has saved my life, but saved my best friend's life wow. one day. It did. Mm. And what's your words to just wrap this all together for the moment? What mm. do we want to say to folks now to have them take that next step, even if it's a bold step? And yeah. I, I think the first thing is stop running around doing so many things. Just stop. I mean, COVID has stopped us all running around. We're so busy. We're missing our intuition. We're not stopping to listen to it. We're not allowing ourselves to process the genius idea or even think about it. So I would cut out a lot of things. I would simplify, specialize, and just have even 10 minutes a day sitting under a tree 
and just see what thoughts come to you. Just 10 minutes a day. Can, that can change everything. And I'd say be brave. You, you, that's one of my favourite words is brave. And I think we need to just go, look, I'm going to make the absolute most of this lifetime. I'm going to, even if people think I'm crazy, I'm going to make the most of me. And I'd love people to be more brave because that's when real um, wonderful things happen. And it's a gift to the world. And, I, and, you know, look, I, I know Sour has gone by so quickly and I hope yes. you will come back um, because I just don't know for many of us, I just don't know if we'll be able to make it through a lifetime if we keep running so fast on the hamster wheel without yeah. stopping to let that yeah. inner voice. And please yeah. tell folks how they can work with you, how they can find a copy of your book. And I'd love to know your personal message. <laughs> well, um, anjersh.com, at, uh, 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 contact me. I'm on Facebook, come and say hi, connect with me. I do a monthly newsletter. You can get my books on um, Amazon, Amazon US, Amazon UK. Uh, I'd love, love you to look at the books because I, I as I said, it's five years obsessive work to work on it. Um, and yeah, dr drop me a line, contact me. I love talking to people. I'm very drawn to America right now. So drawn. And my husband is, he's got an obsession. He wants to go live in Idaho. I've got no oh, idea why. Idaho is beautiful, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I think he's seen it on a few TV shows. He's obsessed. He wants to go and live there now. But um, America's calling us, um, and the energy of America calls me. I, when I talk to Americans, they say, "Oh, it's all crazy here," and I go, "No, you you wait. You're really awake. You're really awake and vibrant." And my message, I think, one of my favorite sayings is, "Do what you can with what you have where you are now." I love that because there's so many times I. I didn't have money. People always, oh, when I've got a better education, when I've got more time, when I've got more money, and we postpone life. And I think just where you are right now, what can you do? Don't wait for the magic extra money, more time to come, because maybe it never will. Do what you can, where you are, or what you have now. That that has got me through everything. Back when I had no money, I had two kids, I had to earn. I thought, what can I, what can I do with my I limited resources? I love, I love that. It's one of my favorite, favorite quotes. All right. That's our message for today, everybody. Thanks for tuning us in. We're going to take a short break. Thank you, Anne. Thank you all. We'll be right back.